Welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is the science journalist John Horgan. Uh, John's work has appeared in Scientific American, National Geographic, Newsweek, The New York Times, Time Magazine, and many other places. Uh, he's the author of several books, including Rational Mysticism, which should be very relevant to this audience, uh, The Undiscovered Mind, The End of Science, and The End of War, uh, and also, most recently, Mind Body Problems, which is available online for free at mindbodyproblems.com. Uh, he also has a podcast by the same name, which you can find at meaningoflife.tv. John is currently the director of the Center for Science Writings at Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey, and he also writes the Crosscheck blog for Scientific American. I really enjoyed today's conversation. We talk about um, whether science can offer objective truths about things relating to the human condition, like consciousness and free will, um, whether mysticism and science are compatible, John's time interviewing very prominent figures in both the fields of kind of science and spirituality, and um, as well as his kind of background, how he's been influenced by psychedelics and also his take on meditation. So I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Okay, I'm here with John Horgan. Uh, John, thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Uh, so you, I think there's a lot of overlap in our in our interests. You've, you've written a bunch of books uh, that I think will all be relevant to um, to my audience. So maybe mm -hmm. a good place to start would be um, just your kind of background, you know, uh, what got you interested in kind of consciousness, mysticism, science, or, and kind of how all these things interrelate. Yeah, well, okay. So um, the answer to that would be sort of, I'd have to uh, mention the generation I grew up in. I, I'm, I was born in 1953, so I, I'm kind of a 60s person. And um, when I was a little kid, I uh, loved math and collecting rocks and collecting in insects. And uh, so I sort of gravitated toward scientific topics. And then I discovered um, psychedelic drugs and the whole hippie culture. And I went veering off in that direction and got really interested in um, mysticism and alternative forms of spirituality. Uh, you know, there were a lot of gurus uh, coming to the United States when I was a teenager and trying to convince us that uh, they had um, they had a method that could make us enlightened. And uh, so I learned about this state enlightenment. I was really intrigued by that. That sounded great. Um, and then I was kind of a nomad for years and didn't know what to do with myself. Um, went to college for one year and dropped out. Um, gradually started going back again in my, uh, in my late 20s. And I finally figured out that there was this thing I could do called science journalism, which would allow me to write about scientific topics, but also to get into philosophical and even spiritual issues that I think science uh, bumps into all the time. And so my career has been a weird mix of writing about hard science topics like particle physics and evolutionary biology, um, you know, applied science. So I, I write about medicine and uh, artificial intelligence and things like that, but also uh, talking about metaphysical, spiritual, mystical issues. Um, I feel very fortunate. I've been able to do pretty much whatever I wanted in my career. I've been able to follow my curiosity wherever it takes me. Yeah, it's always um, strikes me there's such a divide between kind of the, the science journalism and just general science side of way of understanding the world and the spiritual stuff. Because for me, I think I had a similar thing where um, an interest in the weirdness of the natural world was almost identical as it, it gave me very, very similar feelings to the kind of states of awe, right, that people talk about in spiritual states. And I mean, I guess this is why you see, you know, quantum mechanics, you can't kind of look at and not get some weird feeling that like there's something strange about reality. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, I guess that's partly what I'm trying to do here is, is show people the way that these, um, these things are not so different, you know, uh, these ways of understanding the world. And your work is but, a really great example of bringing that together. Yeah, you use the word weirdness. And uh, that's, a, that's a word I use a lot yeah. to describe <laughs> The, yeah, um, well, I've been doing a deep yeah. dive into your work, so I think that's probably why it's it's come to the mind. It's come to mind, yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's do it. Let's dive into the weirdness. 
Yeah. Well, so yeah, your your most recent book, uh, Mind Body Problems. Uh, it's a it's a great title as well. I mean, maybe that's a good place to start. Is uh, your thoughts on the significance of that title? Because it's not as simple as just one particular kind of scientific or philosophical problem, right? Yeah. Um, so the mind body problem the 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 phrase is pretty recent. It goes back to um, 19th century German philosophy. Uh, it was coined in the early 19th century and then became, um, uh, it was useful to philosophers and scientists who were trying to understand the link between matter and mind. So how is it that, that um, a, a clump of stuff, the human brain can give, give rise to perception, to memory, to understanding, to emotions, to the whole mental realm. Uh, and, and that um, set of questions actually goes back millennia. Um, Socrates uh, talked about it. And I think it probably goes back to, I don't know, the, to the first really sentient uh, humans or quasi-humans who were just questioning their own existence and wondering what they really are. I think another way of expressing the mind-body problem is it's the question of what we really are. Are we really matter? Are we, um, are we spirit? Uh, are we um, computer programs? Are we some kind of byproduct of the collapse of the quantum wave function? Uh, there have been all these answers to the mind-body problem throughout history coming both from uh, religion, and I think religion was originally the source of, of popular answers to the, to the mind-body question. So I grew up Catholic, and, and uh, the answer was that, uh, you know, we're souls created by God, and if we do certain things uh, correctly that God wants us to do, we get to go to heaven, so that's great. And there are different religious versions of that. The philosophers had that, their, their own um, set of answers. And of course, in, in our era, over the last couple of centuries, we look to science for answers um, to these, these kinds of questions about what we really are. And the answers tend to be, uh, especially over the last, uh, I don't know, 50 years or so, very materialistic. We're going to explain um, consciousness, mental states generally, uh, in the same way that we explain all natural phenomena in terms of physical processes. Um, and, uh, and so I've been obsessed with the mind-body problem actually since I was a little kid because I've always been tormented by, by these questions about, you know, what is the world and what am I? I'm like the weirdest thing in the world. What the hell is going on here? Um, and uh, and I, I went through a period when I actually thought there would be an answer to that question. And I thought, going back to the 90s, I was really writing a lot about consciousness. I thought it might be something materialistic. Francis Crick, the great uh, co-discoverer of the double helix, he had a set of ideas about explaining consciousness in terms of neuroscience. I thought that that was a sensible program for approaching the mind-body problem. Um, as a problem of primarily neuroscience, but then chemistry and physics uh, below that. And um, over the last, I don't know, decade or so, I've become, I just no longer believe that there is an answer to the mind-body problem. An answer, a single answer. And I think actually it's been a, a terrible mistake for humans to think that there is one answer that applies to everybody and all humans at all times. Um, and it's a mistake, not only kind of from a scientific point of view, it's a moral and ethical mistake uh, because it has led historically the idea that there is just one answer to oppression and genocide and wars. You know, we fight over um, our different ideas about what we really are. Uh, and so I wrote mind-body problems to kind of flesh out this, this growing intuition that I've had that, uh, I mean, I guess if you 
take this idea that there isn't a single answer to its extreme, um, you reach a conclusion that every single individual has to find his or her own answer to the mind-body problem. Um, and that you can change your mind. You know, <laughs> The answer that you come up with now might not be the answer that you come up with a month from now or a year from now. My ideas keep changing. So why, th why should I think that I, uh, I have the right answer? Uh, you know, uh, the objectively, yeah. cosmically true right answer at any particular time. So that's what- I think you're right as well to be, sorry, to be, to be sensitive to the, um, to the way that in the kind of human context in which these things come along, the way that they can be abused, right? Like Darwinian evolution, to me, that's, it's almost a, like a statistical thing. It's, it's a really fascinating, quite a psychedelic like image of forms changing generation after generation and through cooperation, they kind of morph and become different things. Yet that's one story you can tell. But then as we've seen in the 20th century, a lot of people uh, took kind of this neo-Darwinian idea of, of kind of fascism being good because it's a survival of the fittest. And just, just one way of telling uh, one aspect of, of the story of evolution, which I take to be to be true um, about us, but it, yeah, I, I totally get what you mean. It kind of um, even if there are objective answers, they inevitably get kind of mess. They get kind of messed with in this kind of uh, because everyone comes to them with this kind of subjective subjective lens, right? Right, and and it's it's understandable that I mean we're all confused. Well, most of us, um, you know, the, the sort of the, the class of people who, who even care about these sort of things, we're confused by existence and by our own existence. And so we're, we're desperate for answers. And, um, and the problem is that we should never think, I think we, we need to, to uh, honor that that sense of um, curiosity and follow it wherever it takes us, um, but never think that we have the answer. Uh, so um, once we think that uh, we've satisfied this, this craving or this yearning we have that can make us dangerous people. It can turn us into uh, hmm. fanatics. And this happens most obviously in the realm of religion but it also happens with uh, scientific or, or pseudo-scientific, uh, quasi-scientific theories like, as you mentioned, uh, evolutionary biology, which led to social Darwinism. I put uh, Marxism in the category of a kind of totalitarian ideology that, that led to fanaticism and lots of bad things happening, uh, eugenics, obviously, uh, and even things like, um, I don't know, the modern idea that mental illness just is a result of chemical malfunctions in the brain and therefore we need to medicate ourselves out of this problem. Uh, so it's, I guess what I'm looking for is, I, you know, I still think science is our most powerful way of understanding ourselves in the world, um, but we need to be more humble about um, what science can tell us about ourselves. More humble yeah, and more I think modest even the mainstream, way. even Sorry, mainstream yeah. science suffers from uh, from that that kind of um, that kind of issue. You know, uh, you mentioned kind of mental health, right? Like, I think um, whenever there's a kind of dominant culture and systems of power, the story that gets told is always the story that's most convenient to whatever the system is. Uh, and so, you know, seeing science from the inside, you know, I came into it with these very idealistic. Um, the feeling that it's a it's a kind of pure tool that can just kind of cut truth out of the world and then I, I yeah I still think it's wonderful but then I came to realize it's a very powerful tool that's wielded by fallible humans who are, who are trying to make a career and and everything gets kind of funneled through um, all of these basic kind of unconscious human emotional uh, drives so yeah I think if you in anything less than a kind of perfectly equal society if anyone has the kind of narrative of uh, this is this is how you are supposed to be a human, this is the correct way to think about what you are and what it means to be a human, um, I think that's yeah, I can see why that's a very dangerous um, idea. 
And so in, in the book, you kind of explore it through this kind of portraits of, of different very important scientists. You know, you really, you've, you've met, I think all the big names, it seems in, in kind of in these areas. Um, and for me as a neuroscientist, it's great that it starts off with um, Christoph Koch, who's a really important neuroscientist who works with uh, Francis Crick in the early nineties. Um, so maybe that's a good place to go um, because you were really on the scene, uh, you know, when you had this kind of real, the real kind of flowering of, of a scientific approach to consciousness in, in these kind of conferences in the nineties. Yeah. Um, so I've known Christoph and I've never known how to pronounce his uh, last name, different pe people yeah. pronounce it <laughs> different ways. You, you pronounce it Koch, which I often go with because that's, that's what it looks like. K O C H, but it's also, I've heard cock or Coke or anyway, I'll call him Christoph. I've known him since the late uh, 1980s as kind of the sidekick of the great Francis Crick. And they were saying that they could explain consciousness. And as I said before, they had this very materialistic program for figuring out consciousness and tracing it to brain states. As I got to know Christoph, I realized that he was a complicated person. He was, uh, he was a, a devout Catholic, a practicing Catholic through much of the 90s, which is ironic because Francis Crick is one of the great hardcore materialist atheists of all time, but they still had this uh, wonderful friendship. Um, and, and I wasn't sure about the connection between uh, Christoph's Catholicism and his, uh, and his materialism. And um, then, in, um, when was it, like 2005 or 2007, Christoph suddenly announced that uh, he was backing this idea called Integrated Information System, which was this extremely ambitious theory of consciousness that attributed consciousness to certain kinds of uh, information processing in the brain and not just in the brain, but information processing in general. And uh, it was defined, information processing was just defined in this very broad way. So it could even be ascribed to a single proton, which if you look at it in the right way, consists of three quarks that are exchanging information between them. So an implication of this theory that Koch was, uh, was backing is that all matter is conscious. A single proton is conscious. This leads to this ancient metaphysical idea called panpsychism, which says that consciousness isn't just a property of certain kinds of biological matter. Um, it's a general property of, of matter and therefore it pervades the entire universe. I thought this was nuts. Um, in spite of taking a lot of LSD and being interested in mysticism uh, in my youth, I'm, I, I ended up becoming kind of a hardcore materialist. And so the idea of panpsychism seemed ridiculous to me. So I immediately started thinking when I heard that Christoph had gone veering off in this direction, what the hell happened to him? He must be going through a midlife crisis. And uh, he actually started espousing this idea soon after Francis Crick died. His marriage had also ended uh, very painfully for him. A bunch of, his father died, a bunch of things had happened. So I started thinking, ah, obviously subjective personal factors have influenced his supposedly objective view of consciousness, of the, his objective view of this scientific problem. And then that actually was, um, uh, one of the reasons why I wrote mind-body problems, because I, I then sort of generalized that and realized that, of course, in my own case, uh, personal experiences also have an effect on my supposedly objective scientific views. And I knew other scientists who also um, had this interconnection between their personal and professional lives. And uh, so I started to, I thought that a way of exploring that idea would be to have profiles of um, Christoph Koch and a bunch of other scientists who, uh, whom I knew to have had 
um, these sorts of experiences, uh, you know, sort of traumatic or dramatic uh, experiences that her, had changed their scientific outlooks. And then I kind of generalized yeah. from that and said, this is a deep truth that we need to keep in mind <laughs> when we're talking about the mind-body problem. Right. Yes, that's that's kind of where you end up, right? In the kind of conclusion is is that it's it's kind of um, I mean, you, you state it very strongly. You say kind of I mean, as as I read it, um, not only are we kind of um, not only are we deeply fallible when we try to understand ourselves, but you seem to be saying that there is no objective solution. You mean there's, there are multiple things you say, right? You say it's maybe unethical to to settle on an objective solution in the way that we've said, you know, about things like social Darwinism, but, but beyond, and then it's, it's difficult to, because we're all fallible humans with our own personal stories. And there's all this un unconscious emotional stuff going on. I think, well, yeah, when we're trying to, we're trying to come up with theories about, about ourselves. And if, if a theory tells you, if you come up with, you're not going to come up with a theory that you find really like morally off-putting about yourself, I think, right? Like it's, it's hard to, um, it, that, that's just not how <laughs> our minds tend to go. We like to kind of go towards rewarding things. Um, and I think where I settle with that is, um, you know, as someone uh, interested in there being objective truths when it comes to things like consciousness and free will and stuff like that, um, I see it more that I think you're right that like, um, the fact that humans are trying to address themselves it's it's very different than doing physics about you know if you're trying to um well i was going to say if you're going to try and study the climate but actually even then human emotion gets in the way of <laughs> of arguing about what's the truth when it comes to the climate but if you try to um understand the physics of a system that no one really cares about emotionally you're going to have a better time better chance of finding the objective truth so i think i think it gets in the way um, absolutely. And I also think at the moment that um, the time we're living in, I think consciousness is very much like, um, you know, humans have always had this need to justify their, their being different to the rest of the animal kingdom, right? And, you know, before Galileo and Copernicus, it was like, we're at the center of the universe. Um, and then before Darwin, it was like, we're categorically different to other animals. The way that I see people going about thinking about consciousness, it always has this implicit kind of... Um, what is it that's so special about the human brain? What is it that's so special about us? It's a kind of unexamined assumption. I mean, it, it does get examined every now and then, but to me, that's a, a kind of a real stumbling block that people I think are trying, in trying to understand consciousness and how it relates to the physical world, unconsciously, a lot of people are trying to, they've, they've kind of, it's a foregone conclusion that they think the solution is going to justify human, humanity's specialness. And right. so you get things like integrated information theory, which is about human brains are very complex, very integrated, you know. Um, so it turns out that we're, we're kind of more conscious than other, other systems. Um, but I don't think that means there isn't a truth. I just think it means that there's, it's hard to get to it, I think, for humans. Yeah, I, I should say that I am not, I'm not a hardcore postmodernist, although I have become post, more postmodern as I, as I get older. Uh, but um, I became a science journalist because I think science actually figures things out. It, it doesn't just make shit up. It, it discovers truths about nature. And so I think, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of atomic theory of matter, uh, the double helix and its role in uh, heredity, uh, evolution by natural selection, general relativity, quantum mechanics, these are discoveries. These are ref reflections of things that are actually going out on, going on out there that can be empirically uh, substantiated. Um, that's one reason why my first book was called The End of Science. And it's, and it's based on this idea that science discovers things and, and eventually you know the world well enough so that it becomes harder to surpass what you've already discovered. This is like the antithesis of a postmodern point of view. But I am a postmodernist when it comes to, when science turns its gaze back on itself, when we try to understand ourselves, 
then I think that the postmodern critique, which is this kind of skepticism that says that uh, our our knowledge is always kind of a reflection of where we are culturally and a power dynamics in a society. They're all different versions of postmodernism, but it's kind of saying that we don't really discover anything. Uh, we invent things that, you know, we have these stories that we tell about, about the universe uh, that are embodied in, in uh, science and religion and, and other modes of knowledge. But it, so I reject that when it comes to, lots of science, you know, lots of chemistry and biology and physics, but uh, psychology and psychiatry and all the sort of, all the sciences of humanity, um, I think the postmodernists are, are just absolutely right. For you, I guess my question would be, I don't think you can be a real postmodernist as a scientist. So then it's a question of where you draw the line. I. I mean, what do you, for example, think that there can be, I don't know, an objective, empirically validated answer to the question of free will or uh, that we will ever have um, a complete description of the neural code, how you go from, uh, you know, uh, physiological events in the brain to the kinds of mental states that both of us are experiencing right now. Yeah, so I think, I think um, there are two kind of interesting aspects to that. I think there's a sense in which you can be kind of um, a postmodernist, I guess, as a scientist in the sense that I think it's really important to, um, it's really important f to realize that there is no view from nowhere. You know, with science, we're kind of, we feel like what we're doing is we're staying aloof from everything and we're kind of, you know, we have this kind of God's eye view of nature and what, you know, what we see with things like quantum mechanics as well is that we're, we're so deeply embedded in nature that as soon as you try to measure something at the smaller scale, you mess with it in such a way that it is impossible. You just, it, you're, you're so deeply in it. Um, and what you can realize then, and the, the kind of one of the fascinating things about consciousness you know, given that we we build each of our own realities and our, from our conscious perspective, there's only a kind of hall of mirrors of different conscious perspectives, really. Like, that's what I would say what exists um, when it comes to telling stories about the world is this kind of hall of mirrors of, of, of different conscious perspectives. But the exhilarating thing is that, you know, what you refer to as kind of empirical evidence. You can, we we, you know, we can all be solipsists and think we're the only mind in existence, but then you start bumping into things. You know, I bump into something and then you bump into it and we say, hey, did, did you, we check notes against each other and we say, there seems to be something else going on here. It's, it seems there's more. I can't know it directly because all I know is my personal perspective. But if we all get together, we can, we can make empirical claims, right, about um, and divorce uh, our understanding of the world from our own personal biases and our own personal perspective. And that's, the, to me, the thing that's exhilarating about science. Um, and I'm actually quite optimistic. Like, I do think um, the short answer, that's the long answer, but the short answer is yes, actually, I do think we can come up with um, correct or true uh, explanations of what we are because I, I have a, the way I tend to think about humans is very much as a kind of another, I try to think about them dispassionately as another kind of um, thing to be studied, like a, if there was if there was another hominid, if like Homo habilis or another kind of human species was still alive, we would study them. At, well, this is starting to sound quite um, uh, dark, like the eugenic stuff you spoke about before. But we would we wouldn't um, in the same way we can study a chimpanzee. You can just take us as this form that came out of nature, and there will be things that are, you can make claims about it that are more true or less true. Um, so I, yeah, I do think. Um, that we can kind of come up with answers to these things. But when it comes to something like free will, I think, so I've read in, you write that you're, you're a, you describe yourself as a hardcore believer in, in free will. Uh, whereas yes. I'm, I'm kind of convinced that it, it doesn't, it just doesn't fit in my, with my worldview. Um, huh. So you said, could there ever be empirical evidence? And to me, it's like, it's all, it's already solved. That it just doesn't exist is, is <laughs> my, but, but that's me speaking from a particular worldview um, where I think, you know, 
that there's this kind of bottom-up evolutionary process of of the, the physical world unfolding um that leaves no room for it um but uh, yeah i wonder if if that's um i mean maybe that's a good place to go next is is the, you mentioned the kind of limits of science and how you've written you wrote this wonderful book called rational mysticism um a kind of going beyond science right, when it comes to understanding consciousness um so yeah maybe that's a good place to go next and maybe this comes back to the weirdness that i accidentally cut you off about earlier. sure well okay so i i wrote as i said my first book the end of science that came out in 1996 and uh it was uh, an expression of this growing suspicion I had um, that after having been a science journalist for, I don't know, maybe a dozen years, uh, that um, all the major fields of science that are really trying to address some of these ultimate questions about, you know, where we came from and, and uh, where we're headed, what we are, um, we're bumping into limits and uh, that they're, that the really major discoveries were behind them. And, uh, and so the possibility, and yet, you know, there's a lot we don't know. We don't know how the universe was created in the first place. We still don't have an adequate understanding of how life emerged on Earth and uh, whether that was just a, um, a fluke or somehow inevitable an inevitable consequence of the laws of physics and and uh, chemistry and so forth and so i became a science journalist and i think a lot of scientists have this goal in mind too because i wanted to understand what the hell is going on that i wanted a revelation so powerful that it would dispel the sense of weirdness that i've always had when i contemplate uh the world so the world is this is this question and science possibly can deliver the answer and then i just thought that's not going to happen um and so is there any possibility of an ultimate answer of a great revelation and i went back to these experiences that i'd had in my youth uh you know i dabbled in in eastern mysticism and i also took a lot of psychedelics and i had i had lots of mystical experiences, especially from this one particular trip that kind of really gave me almost more of a revelation than uh, I wanted. And so I wrote Rational Mysticism to try to, to answer my own questions about whether there's a way of looking at the world that combines science and mysticism, mysticism and spirituality and religion and all those associated uh, topics in, in, in a way that would sort of be complementary. Um, so in other words, is si are science and mysticism compatible in some way? Um, and I concluded that they are, but not, not in the sense of giving us answers, but more uh, in underlining the weirdness. So science has told us that um, that our existence is highly improbable. The origin of the universe uh, was highly improbable. How the, the Big Bang produced this particular universe. The origin of life on Earth, highly improbable, according to the great Francis Crick, among others, who looked at it. Crick, once again, you know, a total atheist, once said that the longer we look at the origin of life, the more it looks like a miracle. It's really hard to imagine how it happened. And then life produced us, these creatures capable of, of reflection and invention um, who can wonder about their own uh, origins. And so it seemed like science was po pointing in all these directions that instead of dispelling, dispelling the weirdness, made it deeper, exacerbated these feelings. And mysticism for me, my most exalted uh, psychedelic experiences, again, were um, not sort of saying, here's what's going on, where I'd go, oh, right, I get it. It was more just making the world, giving me this emotional, visceral feeling of the weirdness of the world as being mm -hmm. 
infinitely improbable. You go, what the fuck? <laughs> and so it was, it was kind of the emotional uh, complement of what science was telling me anyway, rationally, that there's no reason for us to be here. Uh, we are infinitely improbable. Um, and it's impossible to know why we're here. And yet here we are. That was the only way that I could make mysticism and, uh, and science um, compatible. And for a lot of people, that's completely unsatisfying uh, because they, do, they still want the answers. They want the ultimate answers from, from science or mysticism. Yeah, I think also the thing you said about this kind of the feeling, the feeling, the weirdness and the kind of emotional states. To me, it fits with what we were talking about earlier when it comes to stories about ourselves, whether they're true or not. With, with scientific kind of explanations, you're ultimately just telling a story, right? It's not it's this kind of concept that the map isn't the territory. This, the theories we have can be true, but they're, they're descriptions of reality. They aren't reality itself. They're just a, a way of talking about it. Whereas yeah. with mysticism, I feel that, yeah, it's far more experiential and you're really getting into like, what does it feel like to exist here as this strange like creature? Um, and you, you mentioned, I, I hope I'm getting this right. I seem to remember Francis Crick wrote about, he came to believe in this kind of hypothesis of panspermia, that, um, yes. that, that life may have come from space. Which is, it's, it's strange because, so in your, in your book, Rational Mysticism, you interview Terence McKenna, um, who also had the same idea that, that mushroom spores, because they can survive in a kind of sub-zero temperature, that they can, they can survive the vacuum of space, and maybe mushrooms are these super intelligent kind of aliens that come planet to planet and, you know, make monkeys uh, conscious in, in uh, you know, bring them to this kind of level of consciousness that humans have, was the, was the thinking. Um, and it's funny that uh, when I first saw that the Francis Crick had advocated this, you know, people like Graham Hancock are the other kind of people who talk about the idea of the ancient aliens and, um, and people like Terence McKenna and Graham Hancock are seen as very fringy by the mainstream, right? And yet then you have this Nobel Prize winning scientist basically saying the same thing. Um, yeah, it's very strange. Yeah, when you, get to the, uh, when you get to the borders of knowledge, there's some really strange stuff that happens. I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, Terence McKenna because he brought out, I had sort of a, I, I was very ambivalent uh, uh, toward him. Terence McKenna was this kind of like uh, new generation Timothy Leary figure, except I think he was actually more coherent and intelligent than Timothy Leary. McKenna had was like a psychedelic adventurer and philosopher. He'd have these wild trips and try to make sense of it all. And, um, and he, he liked to say very provocative things. He had this prediction that the world was going to end or change dramatically in 2012, I think it was. And I, I actually interviewed him and in, I think it was the year 2000, it was before 9-11 anyway. And he ended up dying of a, of a brain tumor shortly after I interviewed him. But he was, he was like a provocateur. He was, you know, there's this, this uh, term in, uh, in psychedelic culture called just goofing on somebody, meaning telling them tall tales giving them a bunch of bullshit so that they go, oh my God. And it's all kind of a joke. And so McKenna was like a master of goofing. And he would just say preposterous things. And I, when I interviewed him, I challenged him on this because I knew that a lot of his, his followers, he had avid fans, they believed all the stuff he was saying. And so I said, come on, I, you don't really take this seriously yourself, do you? I was talking about the, the 2012 prophecy and some other crazy shit. And he said, um, he said, no, man, you know, sort of reluctantly, he finally, he finally said, no. He said, I'm just trying to get people to see how weird the world is. And you know, that the, the conventional philosophy and science and religion don't do justice to the profound weirdness of the world. So the kind of, rational, stuffy, scientific American part of my brain was disapproving of Terence McKenna. But the acid head in me was like, yeah, man, you've got it. You, this is, 
that's the way to talk about the weirdness, to just spin tall tales and do it ironically so that everybody knows that no matter how tall your tale is, it doesn't really do justice to the weirdness of the world. Yeah, that really makes me think of, um, so you also, uh, in my Body Problems interview, um, Douglas Hofstetter, who's the kind of, in, in academia, he's the kind of master of, um, yeah, this kind of, uh, I mean, he, so he coined this term, the strange loop, right? Um, he has a book called I Am a Strange Loop. And yeah, this, this kind of weirdness of, um, it's, so I think with, with mystical experiences or psychedelic states, there are kind of two aspects, I guess, that really loom large to me. One is this, the weirdness, the kind of, um, it's like relentless form, relentless stuff just happening, you know, twisting and turning. Um, and so with McKenna, you know, this would be language and kind of puns and, and all this kind of, puns are a big thing for Hofstetter as well, right? It's all this kind of self-referential, loopy, tangled knot kind of uh, stuff, which is actually the kind of front cover of your book, right? Is this logo of a, a tangled knot of all the author's names. Um, but the strange thing to me is that the, the flip side of that is um, when you're immersed in that, the relentless kind of complexity of the weirdness, there's a kind of, a kind of a, an unchanging stillness that can be detected. I mean, to me, this is the kind of the thing that's astounding about consciousness. It's like the one thing that's just this kind of perfect, pristine, uh, light that's shining on all this weirdness happening um, and they can't be separated it's like separating waves from water you know you've got um, all this churning strange stuff that makes up biology and, and experience and um, especially in psychedelic states but then there's also this this kind of yeah um, I guess that's what you just as right and I know um, you've written about you've been a kind of uh, uh, maybe I should just ask you what your stance is on meditation at the moment, because you've written a range of different things on kind of meditation and enlightenment. <laughs> it's funny. I, I, um, yeah, I have, uh, I have a very sort of conflicted, almost like a within the family relationship with, uh, with Buddhism. I mean, going back to when I was a teenager and I was really into, you know, I had friends who got into transcendental meditation and, and who even chased after uh, uh, some of the, you know, these gurus who were coming over from India and attracting all sorts of followers and and accumulating great wealth here. And so I I did I learned Kundalini Yoga. I learned various forms of meditation. I practiced it uh, sporadically, but um, I never got anything remotely approaching what I got from taking. Uh, LSD and mushrooms and things like that. I've gone back to meditation uh, at various times in my life, usually when I was feeling sort of anxious or, you know, I, I unsettled and I, I needed uh, something to uh, help me deal with my emotional difficulties. And I, I never lost my um, fascination with uh, enlightenment and my desire to be enlightened if if such a state existed. And so a couple of summers ago, um, I actually went on, I had just finished mind body problems. And uh, so I was sort of restless looking for something to do. And I went on a uh, one week silent uh, Buddhist retreat and um, it blew my mind. I, I wasn't, uh, so I was doing a lot of meditating, but mainly I was just kind of lying around, especially lying on my back on uh, on a lawn at this retreat center in upstate New York and looking at clouds go by. And, um, and it was an extraordinary experience. I felt like I was tripping for a whole week. So the world became sort of magical and uh, the, you know, the weirdness was popping out at me, but it was also beautiful. So it was this wonderful aesthetic experience. Um, and so I, you know, I wanted to pursue that and uh, to expand upon it, and um, and it just didn't happen. I, you know, I'm I'm too, I'm too. Um, I've got too much. I don't know if it's attention deficit disorder, but I, I I'm I like I need to be busy, and uh, to be doing things, and so actually, at the moment, and I've tried to meditate since then, and uh, you know I've been successful somewhat, but just like a month ago. I decided, you know, I 
my semester ended and I was looking for something to do with myself this summer and I thought of going on another retreat, but instead I decided that I was going to learn quantum mechanics. And uh, so, I mean, really learn it, understand it mathematically instead of in this bullshit uh, half-assed physics for poets uh, kind of way that I've always really understood it. And so I'm now, and I've got a, actually, I'm, I'm holding my laptop up on, on um, a couple of books I'm using. So here's a book on okay. calculus. Okay. I've got a book on, on, non, on linear algebra, and I've been re reading a bunch of uh, books on quantum mechanics. And I realize it's, I, it's giving me something similar to what I had in the retreat. I'm, I'm so directed toward this, this single goal that all my sort of worries and uh, anxieties kind of fall away. And, um, and it's, it's, it feels kind of like a meditative state, even though it involves a lot of difficult mental uh, exertion. So um, I, this is a, a long-winded way of saying that at the moment, I'm, I'm not really meditating very much, but that's because I found something that does the same thing for me. And the thing about meditation that I realized on this retreat and, and, and the conclusion that I reached about enlightenment is that it is a state of absolute goallessness where you just accept exactly where you are and you don't aspire to be anything more than that. You, you, you know, your, all your goals, all of your busyness just kind of dissipates and here you are. It's the old cliche of being here now. And I understand that and I still believe that and I, I know that that's a wonderful state to be in, uh, but I, I feel like that's not what I really am. I am, I like to have projects, I like to have goals. And then it's a matter of finding a goal that is fulfilling for me. And right now, understanding quantum mechanics so I can second guess all those, all those people who say that, you know, many worlds is the right interpretation or David Bohm's interpretation, that's the right one. So I can say, yeah, you're right, or no, you're actually full of shit. I know what I'm talking about. I was um, I was uh, ple pleasantly surprised when I read your article on um, your meditation retreat that it was uh, with Lama Surya Das, who yeah. um, <clears throat> who's a yeah, kind of uh, a Dzogchen meditation teacher, and that's a fairly niche kind of um, strand of Buddhism, but it's the one that resonates most strongly with me. Um, so mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting that um, to arise, and it's it's interesting given what you're saying about uh, the study of quantum mechanics for you being a way of accessing this stuff because that comes out of the kind of uh, the Vajrayana Tibetan Buddhism tradition, which is all, which is where Tantra comes from, right? And Tantra is all about using your energy, not like trying to get rid of your energies, like using it, doing stuff to reach oh. these states. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if in that tradition that, you know, there's something equivalent, you know, um, to using the, you know, don't turn away from that energy, do it, study it, exhaust yourself with studying until you kind of <laughs> experience these states this way. Um, but yeah, and you mentioned the kind of looking up at the the sky because I think in that tradition one of the practices is called sky gazing. And I think yeah, the, the the kind of vibe is one of right, just kind of being maximally open, right, meditating with your eyes open, mouth open, and you're just kind of fully surrendering. And if you're just staring at a kind of expansive blue sky, you can just get this feeling of this kind of this huge expansiveness where you kind of drop away, and there's just this kind of the thing I was referring to earlier, the kind of the thing that's unchanging and still in the midst of all the kind of the weirdness and the loopiness of existence. Yeah, there's the thing, as you said, be here now, right? The kind of coming to the present. And I think they were friends actually, Ram Das, who wrote Be Here Now, and Lama Surya Das. I think they both studied, they both went to the same ashram. Um, that, that makes yeah, sense. I recommend people check him out. Yeah. You no, know, I've got maybe, I've got, since we're talking about, about Buddhism and these meditative states, I'd like to ask you about something. I've got a, um, one of the reasons I'm ambivalent about, about Buddhism and mysticism, even though I'm, you know, I, I, I am also fascinated by 
these states and, and was always seeking mystical experiences. Uh, but one of the reasons I'm ambivalent about it is this, the state of oneness, you know, the term that's sometimes used for an experience where the boundary between yourself and, and the rest of the world uh, dissolves and you realize that all things are one and interconnected. And um, I, I don't like that doctrine as a, and, and it's a result of some of the experiences I've had of oneness and particularly this one trip I had back in 1981, where I experienced it as a kind of nightmarish, terrifying um, emptiness. And, uh, and I, so now I kind of, and I've always been this sort of alienated person since I was a little kid. And, and as I said, anxious about the world, um, wondering what's going on. And uh, now I've come to sort of cherish my alienation, my separateness from the world. I, and I think it's because I, my idea of being in the world, the, the, the state I'm happiest with is when I'm, I'm right here in myself and I'm looking out at everything that's going on. Um, I understand the kind of exalted happiness you can feel if you become sort of spread through the cosmos and your alienated anxious self is just gone. Uh, but I want to be here trying to figure shit out, you know, and, uh, and even though that state goes along with certain negative feelings often, um, it's, it's, um, I think it's just how I'm built. So I'm curious, you obviously are an intellectual and yet you've got, you know, you're also interested in, in Buddhism and psychedelics and, and I assume you meditate yourself. So I just wondered if you, if you feel this ambivalence as well. Yeah. I mean, I think if, if there's a, um, if there's a positive, if there's a way of saying ambivalence with a positive slant, that's probably what I feel, which is a kind of, so the best, the best, the place I've, I've heard this best articulated was actually a lecture by Ram Dass, um called, uh, I think it's the Nowhere to Stand. <clears throat> and you can get, I think you can get it on YouTube. <clears throat> and it's, um, he's making the point, I think that, that you said of, um, he says the, so you can have this kind of, um, this view mm -hmm. where you lose your sense of separation and you realize everything's just unfolding exactly the way it's going to unfold. You lose all attachment to it going a certain way and there's complete liberation from suffering and it's, it's perfect and it's kind of beautiful and it's, and you know, perfect is, is the kind of the word I think for it. And then he says, but then you come back into your, your, your human perspective and you look at all the suffering in the world and you're like, it sucks. It's terrible. It's awful. Like it's, you know, it's the worst. Um, and basically he just says the point of this thing that he's like, what you do then is you just say, yeah, there's nowhere to stand. It sucks and it's perfect. Like it's, and you can, you just kind of, it's, it's very related, I guess, to the idea we spoke about earlier of there's only the different perspectives. There's no objective. It feels like the, the perspective where you lose your sense of self and your, your, everything seems perfect. That the, that carries a weight that makes it feel more legitimate um, than our sense of separation usually but I actually don't think it is. I think they are both equally true. We are relatively separate, but we're also fully embedded in this kind of, this unfolding where our suffering and our self-concern really isn't fundamental, but it does exist. It's like an emergent relative thing that's really there at the emergent relative level. But so, so for, I think um, for me, it's, that, that allows me to, um, I think, be deeply interested in, in sharing this, this, I think I think that I think that's the thing. That's that's my relationship with it. Is we don't want everyone. If everybody just becomes enlightened, it's game over. No one's going to feed themselves. We'll all just die the next day, right? So, um, and actually, I think you. When I was reading about your the big trip, you said you had that was kind of life changing. Maybe I should let you tell this, but it was it was to do with feeling yourself to be God and kind of catching up with yourself, um, and that that being what the whole thing's about. Sure. So I, I had, I had, I think every acid head is always looking for, you know, the ultimate trip where you kind of like burst through the veil of things and you really see what's going on. And uh, 
And I finally had that trip in 1981. It was, I, I'd take, taken some psychedelic that turned out to be much more powerful than anything I have had before or since. It really knocked me out for almost 20 Sorry to hours. interrupt, but wasn't there an interesting backstory as to, I, I heard you, I think on a podcast, say that you got it from some military, something to do with the government, military operation or something. Yeah, I, I finally met the guy just last year who supplied, he, he gave the drug to a friend of mine who gave it to me. And uh, he turned out to be a chemist who was working for a, uh, a defense contractor in North Carolina that was experimenting with like brainwashing agents and incapacitants for the US Army. And uh, so the drug that, uh, that he was experimenting with was something analogous to a drug called BZ, which is like a extremely potent uh, psychedelic. Uh, but anyway, I took this shit and I, you know, I was just expecting a normal trip and it completely knocked me out. I went into this trance state where I was completely disconnected from reality for a really long time. I had all these wild visions. The vision kind of right at the core of it was I felt like I became the creator of the universe. So I, I was God. And for a while it was really great. It was kind of like being in a lucid dream where you realize you have total control over the dream. It can be anything you want. Only your imagination is a limit. So I was doing all kinds of stuff and, uh, and feeling the most intense pleasure that a person can feel. And so that was really great. And then I started thinking, oh, okay, now I should figure out where all this came from. I should try to understand how I was created. I'm God, the creator, but where did I come from? And so I'm just asking myself, you know, these why questions. And, uh, and I realized there, there wasn't any answer because there was, I was all there was. And uh, there, so there was no other thing or entity to give me the answers. And I suddenly became overwhelmed with, um, loneliness and, uh, and horror at my own existence, my own solitude. And it, uh, it freaked me out. And, um, and I sort of, when I'm, you know, this is, this all happened in this tra trance state and I'm, I was trying to reconstruct it after I came out of it, but I have this sense of kind of spinning through space and breaking up into pieces. And what I concluded, you know, after thinking about this for months and years was that, uh, that, that the creator of the universe um, creates because he, it, she, whatever you want to call it, um, doesn't like the oneness, doesn't like uh, this exalted sense of solitude and uh, omnipotence um, and is fleeing from it. And in the course of fleeing, engages in all these acts of creation as a kind of distraction from his own identity crisis. And so one way I like to put this is that uh, God is having an identity, uh, uh, a kind of, yeah, an identity crisis that it leads to a very severe case of multiple personality disorder. And we are, um, we're the different uh, personas of God's personality disorder. We're his uh, alters. Um, another way I put this uh, sometimes is, and this relates to oneness, if nirvana is so great, so there's supposedly this exal exalted state we're all seeking, every, all the Buddhists and Hindus and mystics of oneness, but if that state is so great, why is there creation? And the answer I came up with, and why is creation so shitty? Why is it so painful? Why is there so much suffering and unfairness? And the answer I came up with was that um, nirvana isn't so great, not for God, and that God creates the world um, to try to put up this veil between him and his own self-consciousness. And reality has to be dramatic. It has to be diverting and distracting 
And that's why there's so much suffering and evil in the world. So it was my solution to the problem of evil. And I actually believed it for a while, so much so that I even thought that I had stumbled accidentally on this answer and that therefore there was no reason for the universe to exist because this is all just a dream state. It's a dream state of God. And, uh, and I, I went through a period of kind of semi-psychosis after this trip lasted for, I don't know, six months or a long time where I thought that the world might end any instant and it would be my fault. So it was totally nuts. Um, and I gradually convinced myself that it was totally nuts and pulled myself together. But part of me still believes that. And that's one reason why I'm so ambivalent about meditation and mysticism and, and these kind of unitive states that people seek. Yeah. So I, um, I think a lot of people maybe listen to this, some proportion will probably, that will be their metaphysics. I think that there's like, I think that's kind of the Hindu idea that there is this like, there's a being like a self with with kind of free will that that chooses to kind of become all of us and all of creation that uh you know you use the word alters which i think uh, you interviewed bernardo castro recently who i think is also a lot of people who um who've, who in my audience are fans of his as well and i think he's making a kind of the same case right that there's um maybe this this god is identical to consciousness and then it becomes all of these different forms um now, before I knew any of this years ago, before I had any, I was interested in kind of the Buddhist stuff, but I, I never thought consciousness was fundamental. I, I'd never read about this kind of, um, yeah, the, 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 the story you just told. I had a, basically the identical experience to what you just had. I could have described it with the same words uh, huh. with DMT. Um, and, you know, with DMT, it lasts 10 to 15 minutes. And I went into it expecting kind of fractal, whatever, you know, um, yeah, just kind of, I was not expecting to have this experience of, of feeling like I realized that it, was, it felt like a true religious revelation that there is this supreme self that, the, yeah, I think the way I felt was, was very similar to what you said, that, um, that not even that it's like maybe inherently bad to be in this state of perfected oneness, but that given infinity like you're trapped there infinity for infinity you're not only trapped in the sense that there are no others you're trapped in time like there is no time there's just this state of of oneness and so after some amount of of i mean maybe if, if there's if it's say it's infinite time after some amount of time that being is going to want to do something <laughs> it's going to you know if, if it has any feelings like we have um and yeah so you're right that that escaping into suffering and all this other stuff I, you have to create that if you're if you're going to um escape from this it kind of brings down the energy level was was how i what i felt about it um yeah and i the experience was so um it felt yeah it carried the weight of like a true kind of religious revelation but just didn't fit with my worldview at all and so i think it it really i'm really glad it happened to me because i went from i would probably be sitting here now if that had never happened being a lot more on the hard science side of saying, well, not hard science, but but the culture of science that would say, don't even talk to me about that nonsense. We can't believe there's a God, you know, a God like this. I don't even know why you would entertain the truth of it. And then you have these kind of experiences and you're like, oh, I see. That technically could be true. And I could be fooling myself with my uh, my story. But yeah, where I ultimately come down came down was that I, do, I suspect it's more like um, with those experiences, you know, there's still a self, there's, there's the person having the experience. And I feel like we're kind of, we experience these, um, you know, what you described is very much like the kind of a projection of, of the, the fear of solipsism onto all of reality. You know, you kind of tumble down your own mind and there's only you there. And in the psychedelic state, it feels like this is all there is. And so I think that's a way of understanding it where we don't have to, where we can stick with a scientific kind of metaphysics um, and think about, yeah, the, the 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 reason that um, people come up with these worldviews, you know, and the Hindus use something called Soma famously when they were writing their religious texts. So presumably, maybe they were using something similar and having these kind of strange loopy experiences in their own head and coming up with these narratives of, of the one that creates all of the things um, in, in existence. So do you kind of hold this experience and any 
metaphysical conclusions you might have drawn from it? Is it sort of apart from your scientific worldview? Uh, or, I mean, how, what's the relationship between that experience and what you do as a, as a professional academic scientist? Yeah, so what I would say is I have my scientific worldview and my what you might call my spiritual worldview are the same thing that and they're they're not they're separate to this so if we if we if we park this for me there's reality is like an unfolding process this is far more sub, like something like Taoism, where you kind of realize that there's just this strange unfolding process um and i believe that consciousness is an, is an emergent feature um of reality rather than being being fundamental but the things like enlightenment you know that totally it's just it just makes sense in terms of when you understand the mechanism of suffering being something mediated through concepts and that con our concepts aren't the kind of they're not the same thing as the stuff of reality so surrender your concepts and you 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 don't have to suffer anymore all of that just makes it makes scientific sense to me um then when you have this when i had this other experience that we're talking about that just it doesn't fit with my scientific worldview it doesn't fit with my what I my, the, the spiritual worldview that makes sense to me um so what what I've done with it is it's just given me respect for people who do have worldviews like that basically you know I I was also raised Catholic and for a long time was felt a kind of um I didn't like any kind of dogmatic claims of of you know that there's a god that you can never test you know the existence of um which maybe is why I went went to science um so for a long time i probably would have said i'm not interested in you know if you if you want to if you think consciousness is fundamental or that we we come from some supreme self that's just i'm not even going to entertain that as an idea but then this experience made me see it's very possible for very intellectually serious people to have experiences they come away from and say you know i can't just dismiss this at tr this isn't a trivial experience um yeah, and I think until you have those experiences, it's extremely easy to say you were on a drug. Why would you ever think anything about this experience? But I think the content is so so unexpected. You know, like I think you wrote about kind of mythological imagery, right, and stuff. And I don't know for you if that was to me that's that's one of the big unsolved puzzles is where all this kind of strange mythological imagery comes from. I think you can. So you know, I still have this this hardcore materialist, skeptical, you know, I, I say scientific American mind because I've been writing for scientific American on and off for like 25 years now. Um, and so I, you know, I take these sorts of experiences and you can say, you know, I'm, I'm talking about this terrified God. Well, of course, I'm just projecting my own personal anxieties onto the universe. And I'm saying God feels this way, which is this, which is a ridiculous conclusion and when it comes to the mythological uh, uh, imagery and a lot of this other stuff that I experienced I can I can say well you know I've been exposed to a lot of cultural bric-a-brac since I was a little kid and it's all stored in my brain somewhere and there's this kind of hyper dream function that's activated on psychedelics that is putting all those things together and constructing these uh, these dream narratives, um, so I can do that. And part of me thinks that, of course, that's the most sensible uh, response to these sorts of experiences. But uh, but then there's this other part that is kind of separate. But I I can't get rid of it, nor do I want to, uh, because I feel fortunate to have had this these experiences, uh, where I think no, I might have actually had a glimpse of something really important going on. There's not much I can do with it when it comes to living my life and having a job and being a professor and a writer and all this kind of stuff. But at the very least, when I meet somebody like you, who has had these experiences also, it's like, wow, that's really cool. It's like, we're all sort of floundering around in the dark. This goes back to what you said about solipsism uh, early in our, in our conversation that, that, you know, we're all trapped inside our own little private dreamscapes, but we also have these, this ability to communicate, to, 
to sort of signal people that we spot out there in the darkness beside us. And every now and then you go, hey, did you see that? And you go, the other person goes, yeah, yeah, I actually did see that. And um, if only for the companionship, those moments are really great. Uh, you know, it's hard to know how to go beyond, how to sort of take the, the, the insights that we've had or these experiences and build them in a kind of cumulative way. Where do you, beyond saying that, that you know, the universe was created by some insane demiurge, you know, okay, so where do you go with that? And part of me even thinks that that is, you know, after I had this experience, I even thought of becoming a monk for a while and just contemplating my experience for the rest of my life. But I, you know, I, because it was so alienated, alienating, it really pushed me away from other people and, and from the things that I had wanted to do with my life. And then I decided that, no, I still want to do those things. I still want to have a relationship. I want to get married. I want to have children. I want to be a writer. I want to be a professional. And, and that, you know, and, and being contemplating the, you know, the ultimate source of everything, this crazy God was distracting me from that. It wasn't a good thing. Um, so now that I've, you know, I've been living my life for a while, I'm a more stable person. I, I feel like I can go back to that experience and appreciate it on its own merits without it completely shattering the life that I've put together for myself. Yeah, I think, I think what's exciting about um, psychedelics kind of coming back out into the open is that, is that as you kind of said, like, what you really need is um, communities of people to, to kind of talk to each other and say, hey, did you see that? Did you see the same, same thing? And start to kind of cross check because I think what's fascinating is, you know, you take a kind of typical psychedelic experience. I think the experience of oneness, you can come away from that and you can look at physics, you can look at the world through the, with this new insight and go, oh, it makes sense. I really am an emergent, strange feature of the world. I, I genuinely am kind of separate, but I'm really of a piece with the rest of it. Um, but then you can say, well, I also saw my face melt in the mirror. My face didn't actually melt. That I'm going to say that one's, <laughs> I'm not going to take that as a genuine insight. And then you've got these really strange ones in between. Yeah, like how are you? How do you move forward with the um, the neurotic god thing? You know, and, and I guess I guess philosophy is probably the answer there. Um, but I think it's exciting that now, for a long time, people would have to be stuck in their own minds with this stuff, right? And I think it can be alienating for people. You have these in insane experiences, um, insane in the sense of incredible, <laughs> um, and maybe also in the sense of <laughs> uh, detached from reality, but. Yeah, if, if you go to the average person, they're just, you're going to sound nuts, right? Um, so um, I think having having kind of more conversations out in the open like this is is definitely the way forward. Um, and also maybe a good place to end is you um, you recently did ayahuasca for the first time, right? Actually, I, was I, like? the first time I did ayahuasca was in 1999. I did it uh, okay. as research for rational mysticism. And then um, I just did it again... Uh, when was that? Uh, two years ago, I guess, in um, out on suburban Long Island, in a basement of a modest ranch home, with about I don't the know traditional setting. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and I, I think both of my ayahuasca experiences were I was there. You know, I'm I'm just tripping my brains out, uh, but I was there primarily as a journalist or kind of a sociologist. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, um, I'm, I'm looking around at these people, most of whom are strangers. Uh, so in, in Long Island, uh, it was people young and old and some very sort of conventional middle-class people. At least that's what I was gathering from looking at them. And we all introduced ourselves at the beginning. And then you get into the experience and people are retching and uh, they're crying and they're moaning, they're sobbing. You know, they're, they're just in all these different states of misery. There is a guy right next to me uh, who I actually did know 
um, who was alternate, he'd never, I think, taken any drugs before. And he was alternately laughing hysterically and sobbing uh, miserably. And, um, and I'm thinking, what the fuck? What, what are we doing here? Um, and I mean, the answer is just that everybody's looking for something. Everybody is, uh, you know, we find ourselves here and um, our lives are also often painful. And even when they're not painful, they're mysterious, they're confusing. And so we're, you know, we do these crazy things like taking this stuff that makes us really sick uh, with all these strangers to, to try to find answers. And the paradox for me is that, you know, doing those things in my case has never really given me answers, except for maybe the crazy God, whatever that's worth. Uh, it's just, um, it's just kind of revealed the, the, the depth, the, the infinite depth of the questions. And, and even my crazy God idea, uh, you know, that God didn't have the answer either. That God was in a way more baffled than us. I, I, I you know, my, my experiences have led me to think that, um, as we evolve, the smarter we get, the more self-aware we get, uh, the more baffled we will be by our own existence. Um, and that doesn't mean it's futile to try to seek the answers uh, because we do discover a lot of stuff on the road to try to trying to understand everything, uh, but we never can understand everything. Um, you mentioned there's two phrases you've used that I, res I use a lot as well, where you said, we find ourselves here. And then you also said, what the hell is going on? And, and kind of as I take those as two, to, I, I find myself saying those two phrases a lot. And uh, it's quite nice to see a resonance there of, of maybe coming back, coming down to, um, yeah, they're, they're kind of very casual phrases, but I think they really point to a certain way of seeing the world where, you know, instead of being like, I'm a scientist and I'm going to start from my science textbooks tell me there was the big bang and there's, you know, or you say I'm spiritual and I believe I'm an incarnate soul or something. Instead, there's this kind of, um, this, I guess it's like a seeker mentality of just like, what the hell? Like I I'm here. There's some weird stuff happening. <laughs> like, and then I think when you come at, when you come out with the world that way, you don't have to, you know, use kind of uh, exalted terms like science and philosophy and spirituality. You could just say all of that. I'm just going to use whatever tool I can, communication, co you know, conversation, whatever works, you know, drugs, like anything that will kind of give me a feel of what, like, what the hell is going on? Because here I am. And that's at, at the bottom. That's all I know. Right. I mean, not to kind of yeah. reiterate, reiterate on uh, Descartes. And we have, and we have, um, and we have companions on uh, here in, in this, uh, in this great mystery, fortunately. Um, yeah. And uh, so it's, it's like, that's one of the great pleasures of, uh, of, my, of my life and of my sort of professional uh, life, which is all intertwined with my personal life, is meeting other people uh, who are interested in these same questions and are sort of stumbling into, onto some of the same sort of quasi answers. Um, that makes it a lot more pleasant than if I was just wandering around all by myself. Yeah. Actually, one, maybe one final thing. Um, you, you kind of, in the book, you talk in Mind Body Problems about, you know, the idea that there may not be one objective solution to, um, to these questions. Do you have, on, you know, when it comes to um, consciousness and how it relates to the material world, the, the menu is currently, you know, you've got everything from there's only consciousness through to matter is conscious, all the way to kind of consciousness is an illusion you know, I'm in the middle, I believe it's a kind of pan-biological thing, something to do with the life process. Do you, where do you situate yourself on that, on that spectrum at the moment, if you have a place? It's hard to say because I'm, I'm sort of, you know, the psychedelic part of me makes me sympathetic toward the world is fundamentally conscious, consciousness. So it, some kind of like acid tinged idealism. Uh, but then I'm, I'm still really a materialist. I, I guess, 
the the way I look at these things, the, the kind of meta point of view that I have though, is that um, we have all these languages for talking about these questions and our languages are ridiculously inadequate. And there might be whole new languages uh, that we have in the future as a result maybe of new inventions, new tools that come from science um, that give us a whole new set of answers and ways of talking about the relationship between mind and matter. And one thing that I, I, that also sort of affects how I think about these questions and how I talk about them is the idea that we should never limit ourselves by reaching premature conclusions about what we are because that limits our freedom to, to recreate ourselves, to be different things that go beyond any conceptions that we have now of what we really are. So I sort of see, you know, I have this ethical value of freedom that is completely intertwined with um, my ideas about truth. And I still haven't really figured out what the implications are, but it just makes me think that everything Everything is possible right now. I, I'm I'm very open-minded, and I'm I'm really curious to see where all our debates about about the mind and body and and um, all the problems associated with that where where those debates head in the future. Yeah, I think that's a really nice, maybe a seeming paradox in uh, in this way of thinking about things that it's not nihilistic, right? You're not saying. There is no objective answer, so everyone shut up and stop. Stop with your theories. You know, it's it's taking pleasure in the kind of it's almost like hoping the game never ends. That you can just keep thinking, oh, what if this is the way it is? What if this is the way it is? Absolutely, that's 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 pretty much it. And that also gets back to this idea of of companionship, talking about it among ourselves and mm. arguing and and hearing your ideas that maybe send me off in a different direction. That's what makes all this so much fun. Yeah, that's nice kind of bringing the humanity back into the scientific endeavor because at the start of the conversation i was saying how i thought it was a shame that science had isn't as as pure of a tool as it might be because it's wielded by fallible people but actually bringing the humanity into it and saying well maybe that's the game you know we're just going to keep going and keep each other company and that's that's what it's all about well right. thank you so much john this has been really really enjoyable um if people want to kind of follow up on your work is there anywhere you'd send them in particular uh, well, Mind Body Problems is posted on the internet for free. And you can buy a print version from Amazon, uh, but it, but it, I posted it for free on the internet and it's got all these embedded notes and lots of cool art. And, um, and then I'm constantly uh, writing columns for Scientific American. And so you just Google John Horgan and Scientific American, you can get a lot more stuff than you could possibly want to read. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I really recommend people check out the book. It's a really novel way of doing things, having this kind of multimedia uh, stuff embedded within it. It's really, really great. All Thank right, you. thanks again, John. Hey, same here.